Yeah, right. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, on this last Sunday of Advent, uh, it's an exciting day. We won't have another church Sunday until Christmas has come, and we've celebrated it adequately. As Rhiannon said, we are celebrating it uh, Christmas Eve, that is this coming Thursday. We are planning two services. We've sent out a survey, as Rhiannon said. It's really important that you fill out that survey because we are prepared to have more services on the 23rd, but we'll need to make that decision tomorrow. So if you could fill out that survey as soon as possible, we want as many people to safely experience the Christmas Eve celebration. So we will do what it takes to make sure that we can do that, including extra services. So please fill that out. Um, I just want to speak a little bit before I get into the text. Uh, for those of you who have your Bibles at home or your apps and you want to open up and get ready, uh, we're in Colossians chapter 1, starting with verse 15 today. So you'll want to open up your Bibles for that. But I wanted to cover a couple of things leading into that. Um, I wanted to address, um, on top of the words that Rhiannon said, um, the current environment, the current climate, the current COVID situation, all of those things. Um, we are, as a nation and as a community, in, in the middle of a pandemic. Um, COVID-19 is spreading. We've been touched by it here enough that we wanted to be safe, take two weeks, sanitize the church, isolate, um, have some people get over COVID. Um, so that we could be safe together on Christmas Eve. So I can assure you that come Christmas Eve, on the VCF side, on the VCF family side, on the VCF staff side, we are doing everything to make sure that our celebration is as safe as possible. Um, I'm going to talk a little, bit, a little bit more about COVID in my sermon than, than normal, but um, one of the things that kind of drew me to this passage to close out Advent um, was this idea of what does VCF mean? We, we say VCF means family all the time because we mean that. When you're a part of the VCF family, you are family, and there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Um, but what does that actually mean? And what else does VCF mean? Th those are the questions that kind of haunted me as I, as I studied this. So if you want to follow along with me, I'm going to read this text, and then we'll go back and go through it. So, Colossians chapter 1, starting with verse 15. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. So that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. And through him to reconcile to himself all things. Whether things on earth or things in heaven. By making peace through his blood shed on the cross. There's a lot to unpack here. But I think that one of the most important things that it does is, is I, 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 I feel like all too often we use the terminology that we need to be more like Christ or we need to be aspiring to be more like Christ or we need to be Christ to the world. And, and the truth is, is that's an impossible ask. For me to look you in your face and say, I need you to be like Christ is like telling a dragon to suddenly become real. I mean, it's just not going to happen. We are not capable of being perfect like Christ. That's why he was needed to redeem and save the world. So I think that what we need to be is who Christ has called us to be, which is to be more Christ-like. So what does that look like? What, is it, what does it mean to say VCF means family? I was thinking about that, and um, one of the things that just it won't leave my brain, so I'm just going to talk it out. Um, is this idea that VCF means home. And, and not necessarily that this building is some place that's so comfortable that we, you know, can stay here. No, not even. VCF means home because our home is the ultimate representation of our family. 
What we do in our homes is always, always ends up being so much different than what we do when we're outside of our homes. We're, our family dinners when there's no guests are different than our family dinners when there are guests. And, and there's all of these things. And one of the things that I think that it means to be a family is to let those guards down and not be somebody different in different situations. You see, what this passage is telling us is it is setting up the supremacy, why Jesus is who he says he is, and why it's so important for us to believe that. But I think that all too often we believe it in segments and compartments in our life. We compartmentalize it into the the Jesus when we need him, but when we don't, we are just this different person over here, and we create these dual identities. To truly believe in Jesus Christ means to truly believe in something that is so much bigger and powerful than yourself that it has the power to save people from sin. A a power that no man on earth, no woman on earth, no child on earth, no king, no ruler, no president, no senator, no parliamentary personnel, nobody has the power to save from sin other than Christ. Just on that basis alone, we have to concede to Christ that power and authority and sovereignty. And we need to quit trying to wrestle it and grapple with it to the ground on our own. All too often, one of the things that when you're a pastor, when you interview for for jobs with other churches, if you interview with a district superintendent or another senior pastor, inevitably it's going to come down to this question. How many people have you led to Christ or how many people have you saved in the last year? My answer is always zero. And I know that answering zero is eventually one day going to cost me a a job unless I retire from here, which I want to do. But the truth is I don't have the power to save a soul. I don't even have the power to lead someone to their salvation. All I have is the ability to be a willing participant, a vessel in the the process. God, through the Holy Spirit, uses us to advance his kingdom. And when we do not put ourselves as a vessel in the exact place that he needs us, then we will be responsible for missing an opportunity. But we cannot own the power of salvation like we had anything to do with it. When we celebrate the birth of Christ, what are we celebrating? Are we celebrating the birth of a baby? Because you know what? Today, I'm celebrating the birth of a baby. It just isn't baby Jesus. Happy birthday, monkey. Um, Today is a day that I would celebrate the birth of a baby, but she's not a baby anymore. So at some point, you've got to stop celebrating the birth of a baby, and you have to celebrate the life of an adult. In this case, the life of a man who lived a perfect life just so that we could be redeemed from our terrible choices and sin. It would have been a great sermon to say, you know what, Genesis 1, the first page, we walked with God, story over. But that's not what happened. So now we have this whole reconciliation narrative, this idea that that the world was so jacked up that we now need a solution, and that's the truth. We now need a solution. And so in Colossians, what what Paul is saying here is the Son, in in verse 1, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Understand what that line says. That says that Jesus Christ was the first created ever Period. When God set out to create the world, Jesus Christ was present at creation. The firstborn in all creation. This is not just the story of zero AD, Jesus coming into being. We understand that we're celebrating this physical manifestation of Jesus Christ, but the spiritual manifestation and the birth of Christ happened at creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. This is where book burning and picketing and all of those things, this is the passage that makes me grind my teeth. Because if we pay very close attention to what it's saying, there's some fancy words in here, some really difficult to translate and understand words. And and you know what? I know that they might not be in most people's dictionaries, but we should all understand what words like all mean. All. 
It doesn't leave anything. There's no all, however, all, but. It's just all. God created all things and all things are for him. We don't get to decide what is of him and what's for him because scripture tells us repeatedly, more specifically in this passage, that it's all for him. God will take a despicable situation and turn it into a glorious movement for his kingdom and he's done it over and over and over and over and over again. You you see moments of forgiveness in national tragedy. You see moments of forgiveness in, in the most heinous of crimes. We see redemption play out in front of us but our focus has to be on what happened not what God did. I listen to a lot of true crime podcasts, and one of the things that irks me about true crime podcasts is it glorifies, lifts up, and tells the story of evil people. We don't hear enough about what happens, what what wake of destruction, or what redemption occurred after the heinous act that true crime podcasts have a tendency to cover. We lose sight of the fact that this person may have done something absolutely atrocious to an entire family, but that family's forgiveness and spiritual growth and community revival is this redemptive story of showing how God will take the least things in our life and turn them into the greatest things in his kingdom. And a lot of times we just don't allow that to happen. And we don't allow it to happen because we don't have the patience or the ability to articulate that properly. Because we're so hung up in us and how we feel and what's going on. And there are times that we have to do that. I I gotta tell you, one of the things that I have seen and experienced over the last couple weeks is the COVID stigma. If you are somebody that, that has COVID or had COVID, Even the people who are closest to you, they're so concerned about you and they want you to be well, but they also don't want you anywhere around them. And rightfully so, when you have it, I get it. But can can I just tell you that you're only sick from COVID for a few days? You're not sick for 14 days. You're sick for three or four days. Even after negative tests and, and after the proper amount of quarantine and all of that, people will still keep their distance from you just simply because you were positive. And I've got to tell you, this goes back to the whole sin thing, right? If you had to wear a sandwich board, an A-frame sandwich board that was giant, that listed the worst thing you ever did in your whole life as a requirement to attend church, every church in the world would be empty. There wouldn't even be pastors because they'd have to wear that sign. Because then what, that, what we would be doing is, is identifying them based on what was on that sandwich board instead of what was in their heart, what was in their body, what was in their soul, and what God's redemptive work has done in their life. You see, we don't have to be identified by the worst thing we've ever done in our life because the sovereign God reconciled us to him through the blood of Christ. And there's a really important understanding in here because I, I bring up... The, the, the COVID consciousness because one thing that I can tell you beyond the shadow of a doubt is if you end up with a, a COVID diagnosis and you end up locked in your home for 14 days, what you're going to need when you come out is love and support. And when you don't get that because people are afraid you're going to give them the next great plague, what we're doing is, is we're harming people emotionally and mentally just as much as that illness can harm them physically. So we're entering into this new phase of, of kind of navigating this, this whole pandemic, and that is more people are going to have had it than not had it, and are we going to treat them like they had a cold last year, or are we going to treat them like they have the plague that ends the world when they come out of it? And I gotta tell you, we as the church, we've gotta lead this. The people who are recovering from COVID, they need love and support, they need contact, they need to know that they are not alone even when they're alone, and I think that we need to be better at that. And and, and I gotta tell you, I thought this before, but I feel it even more now. When I think about how we are supposed to 
come across to a world that has never been looking for answers more than they are right now. I feel like the church is at this pivotal moment where revival is actually within our grasp that we can see, touch, and feel, which, believe it or not, you cannot make revival happen. We can have music bands, we can have guest speakers, we can do all of those things, but you cannot make revival happen. The only way revival happens is when we surrender to it to happen. Revival happens when we don't try. Revival happens when we allow God to change our lives and we throw that out into the world. We become part of God changing lives and lives and lives. It is a never-ending cycle until somebody stops doing it. And this is, this is the great struggle of all mature Christians. We've got to know that no matter how mature we get, we cannot let up. No matter how crazy life gets, no matter how wickedly bonkers work gets, no matter, no matter how crazy the holiday season gets, we cannot take our foot off the gas. We've got to be constantly showing the miraculous work that God has done in our lives in the hopes that he will do it in the lives of those that get to witness it. If you listen to Christmas songs, they all have this one thing in common, proclaiming the truth this holiday season. And I would venture to say that we do a pretty good job during the holidays. But we need to take the Christmas message and we need to make sure that it doesn't get stolen away because Christmas is over. The biggest threat to Christmas is that it will be stolen just by nature of the calendar. We can allow for the stealing of Christmas by letting the reason for the season rest only in this season. So you can keep your reason for the season bumper stickers and you can keep the, your, your, your all-out assault on anything that doesn't have to do with Jesus around Christmas. And let me just put it to you this way. If you're one of those people, show it to me in July. Show it to me in July. This is not a time to take a step back. This is a time to take a step forward. This is a time to get in sprinter's position, wait for the gunshot, get in the blocks, and go. There's an important passage in this. And it's the last verse, so it's, it's verse 20. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, there's that tricky word that is hard to define, all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven. And here it is. Understand that this sentence makes absolutely no sense whatsoever, okay? By making peace through his blood shed on a cross, one of the most violent acts in human history. If you've seen the passion of the Christ, the, most experts think they laid up a little bit that it would have been almost twice as bad as it was shown on that movie. Just to give you any idea. That brutal moment is a benchmark for peace. Understand that Jesus didn't come to start a religion. Jesus didn't come so that we could have a church and we can have a live feed and we can have videos and we can have worship and we can have kids club and youth group and all of those things. That is not why Jesus came to earth. As a matter of fact, he knew that it would happen, but it's not where his mind was. He didn't call us to build churches and create programs. He called us to advance the kingdom with his message of grace and mercy and peace and hope and love. So as we take that turn where we won't gather together until it's time to actually celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ with our Christmas Eve celebration. As we take that turn and we finish this series on stealing Christmas, let me just tell you that the, the fastest way that you can steal Christmas is you can forget about it on December 26th and pick it back up around Halloween. Just because we started earlier with the Christmas music and the decorations, ugh, doesn't mean that we're carrying it longer. It just means that we're buying it sooner, really, in a nutshell. 
and have all that fun. Enjoy it. Enjoy the, the traditions, the, the crazy bonkers traditions that make no sense. Enjoy the, the music and the caroling and the gifts and the, the, the smells. In Christmas morning, my house will smell like the most delicious cider you've ever had. And it's really simple. It's just cider with red hots poured into a crock pot. It's the best smell in the world. So I care less how it tastes, but I love my house smelling like that. Do I want it to smell like that in July? No. No. But do I want to celebrate the birth of grace in July? Yes. Let's, let's not just celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. Let's celebrate the birth of grace. The birth of the most ultimate grace that has ever been offered. The definition of grace is being given something that you absolutely do not deserve. And if you think for one moment that you are entitled to and deserving of the grace of Christ, you've got it all wrong already. We receive this most expensive gift. Every breath that we take in. And we receive it through a horrific act of violence that was intended to produce the largest act of peace that's ever existed. We cannot steal Christmas, but we can embrace what it means. So, Will you celebrate with me? The rest of this week, we're going to celebrate the birth of grace. The birth of a child that would save the world. And keep our eyes focused on what that grace means, not just that it came to the world. Pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, what an honor and a blessing it is. Just feel so incredibly blessed to be in your presence, to be around people that you've put in, in my life and people you've put in each other's lives and just what, a, what an incredible blessing and honor it is to be blessed with those people. I pray for every person that, that we haven't come across yet. I pray that when we do come across them that, that we are showing your grace and not just your bumper stickers. Have us be a people that preserve Christmas and not participate in stealing Christmas. As we turn the corner into the hecticness, Lord, I just pray for people to be safe. I pray for people to be sane. And I pray for hearts. Hearts that are struggling. Hearts that are lonely. I pray for everybody who is isolating and recuperating from COVID. I pray for everybody that is living in fear as a result. Have us be a people that, that don't let that fear paralyze us from being who you've called us to be. Thank you in your son's name. Amen. I want to end with something um, important. Um, I want everybody to feel safe, and I want everybody to feel respected. And so when you hear me saying it's safe, please come back to church. It's never been safer. That's me making sure that you know that we've done everything that we can do humanly possible to make this as safe for you as possible. It's not intended to, pers to, to persuade you to come to church. It's not intended for, for me or for VCF to take a position on whether or not you should come to church or not. We need to be gathering together, but we need to do it safely. And if your heart is struggling, you're not going to worship. That's why we have all of these options for you. But I want to let you know that, that we will be safe here and we will be respectful. And, and I can tell you that the VCF staff here um, had a hev heavy respect for COVID before two weeks ago, but we have a very healthy respect for it today. Um, and as a result of that, you will only see that in caution. Um, I also want to say a last word about uh, the adoptive families. We had a second family that we were getting ready to line up, and then we had this shutdown, and um, with Cindy passing away suddenly, she only had one, one dying wish and one article in, in her trust, and that was to be married, buried next to her mother. And so I think one of, the, one of the greatest stories that we will ever have to tell 
is that somebody came in our doors broken and lost and left a little less broken and a little less lost. And I can't say enough about Cindy and AJ coming in here shattered and broken and leaving here every week more whole, more whole. Cindy almost lost her life in March, right when the pandemic started, and she was in hospice, and nobody could visit her. And that was a really lonely and stressful time, and the doctors gave her no chance of survival. And she made a huge recovery and had six months of a quality of life that she couldn't have imagined nine months ago. And so we are going to celebrate that blessing and that gift. But this is a great opportunity for the VCF family to love on one of its own, because... Their lives are changed today because they walked in these doors and we embrace them like family. And so I would encourage your generosity with both of these families. These, look, it's easy to spoil kids. We spoil them rotten, okay? And it's easy to take care of a family that, that needs it. But these are families that have been a part of the VCF family from day one. And uh, I'm just... I'm really excited about the opportunity to love on them. One last note, I am letting you know that over the course of the next couple of weeks, right after the first of the year, you'll be receiving information on a new ministry called VCF Means Home. I, I, I really stuck on that. I would encourage you to go read the news articles that are coming out. There's an interesting thing that's happening, and I believe that Congress is going to put a stopgap into it, but I don't think that it's a permanent solution. So we have, a, we have a permanent issue that's coming up. It's called housing insecurity. If you've ever heard the term food insecurity, it's people who don't know where their next meal is going to come from, so they're very insecure about meal. There are almost 20 million Americans that are about to experience housing insecurity because there's a ban on being evicted. That ban goes away. There are between 14 and 20 million Americans that can be evicted on the spot. We're creating a housing issue. There are good families with jobs that were getting by before COVID that are going to be left with nothing. And so I believe that what it means to be a family, VCF means family, means to actually do something about a situation that's right in front of us. So I'm going to be proposing and presenting this ministry called VCF Means Home, and it is entirely meant to alleviate housing insecurity. The, the homeless that, are, that have jobs but just can't get off the streets because it's just not enough. The families that are going to be evicted because they couldn't pay the couples that are just starting out. Housing insecurity is going to be the great tragedy of 2021, and I believe that VCF has an obligation to do something about it. So please, stand by. You will get the details shortly after January 1st. If you, what I've told you piques your interest at all, talk to me on Christmas Eve or, or next Sunday, and, and I'll share with you a little bit. Um, but be in prayer. People we know and love, they're going to be affected by this, so be in prayer. You guys have a great day. Take care.